Well, the federal government is faulting former president Olusegun Obasanjo over his claims that President Muhammad Buhari has nothing more to offer Nigerians in terms of handling of his insecurity. Well, former President Obasanjo had at a security retreat in Abuja said Buhari had done the best he could for the country and called on Nigerians not to expect anything more from him. But the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, disagrees. He is insisting that President Buhari has done better than his predecessors in tackling insecurity amidst the very difficult economic and social conditions. Mohammed says Nigeria is safer today than it was before May 29, 2015, and that securing Nigeria and Nigerians is a top priority for the administration. Since assuming office in 2015, President Muhammad Buhari has continued to make the issue of security a major plank of his administration's policy. This is not a surprise, considering the fact that the fight against insecurity is one of the three priority areas of the APC-led federal government. Yes, the security situation has continued to pose a great challenge. But amidst the cacophony of voices, some genuinely concerned about the situation and others ready to exploit it for selfish ends, it is easy to forget where we are coming from. Today, we only look at the current situation without wondering what would have been had this president not taken the bull by the horns as far as security is concerned. With the way the insurgents were going before this administration came into office, with the control of a vast worth of land the size of Belgium, with their free wheeling attacks in almost a dozen states, including the Federal Capital Territory, which was hit at least five times. Perhaps they could have achieved their aim of declaring an Islamic state in Nigeria if President Muhammadu Buhari had not acted decisively. After all, in 2014, Boko Haram declared a caliphate in Goza after capturing Bama and Gamburu, as well as other towns and villages in Brno, Yobe, and Adamawa states. They installed their own emirs, collected taxes, and flew their flags before the military dislodged them. Yes, banditry and kidnapping have added to the state of insecurity. President Muhammad Buhari has also continued to provide quality leadership in order to ensure that our security agencies decisively tackle the cankerworm of insecurity of any EU. No administration in Nigeria's recent history has provided the security agencies with the hardware needed to tackle insecurity as that of President Muhammad Buhari, in addition to raising the morale of our security men and women. Only last week, Mr. President commissioned an armada of naval boats and ships in the latest efforts to enhance our nation's maritime security. The Army, the Air Force, and the police among others, have also been receiving more than hardware to strengthen their arsenal. Gentlemen, President Mohamed Buhari has done so much under very difficult economic and social conditions to tackle insecurity in our country. Not only has he done so much, President Mohamed Buhari continues to do much more to keep Nigeria safe. To say he has nothing more to offer is untrue, fallacious, and smacks of dirty politicking. By boosting the number and capacity of our fighting forces, 
the president is putting them in good stead to tackle insecurity, not just during the life of his administration, but long after he would have left office. President Mohamed Buhari is leaving a legacy of security, infrastructural development, economic prosperity, and social cohesion for Nigeria. This may not be seen, this may not seem obvious today amidst daunting challenges, but posterity will be kind to this president. Well, in the meantime, the Federal Executive Council has approved a review and upgrade of salary of police personnel in the country by 20%. This is to take effect from January 2022. It says the review is in response to the demands made by NSAS protesters in 2020 for improved welfare of police officers. The president has promised that the salaries will be upgraded commiserate to service rendered to further maintain peace in the country. The full session the take home pay will be enhanced through the uh, improvement of uh, uh, issues such as uh, 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 duty tour allowance, which has been reviewed from 6% uh, to uh, reviewed to 60% of the new take home pay. And uh, council has also approved. Uh, payment of one billion one hundred and twenty thousand one hundred and seventy two Nara one fifty Kobo uh, for payment as yes. outstanding benefits of uh, personnel for uninsured period of twenty twenty three to twenty twenty. 2013 to 2020, that has not been covered under the group personal accident insurance. Uh, it has also approved the release of 13 billion naira, 127,000, uh, 100 and, uh, 137,972,000 naira. 269 Naira 20 Kobo for payment as outstanding death benefits of 5,472 personnel for the uninsured period of uh, 2023 to 2013, I beg your pardon, to August 2021, not covered under the group life insurance. What strikes me? Well, meanwhile, the chairman of the Stay Arise Media Group, Unduka Obaigbena, is advising the federal government to introduce a security tax in order to effectively fund security agencies and curb the rising cases of insecurity in the country. Speaking at the first memorial of the founding chairman of leadership newspaper, Sam Nda Isaiah, Obaigbena said securing Nigerians is a key challenge facing the present government. What strikes me the is on the issue of security. Having a totally new security architecture. He talked about the million to four million security personnel. That's a great idea. But how do you pay them? How do you train them? How do you equip them? So the one way, I believe, is to have a security tax. We pay taxes every day, securing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we have a security tax that is managed by a, 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 a trusteeship that can have this recruitment, then I think we can go somewhere. So having ourselves secure is the number one problem that challenges this government and the next government. Well, Rufai, I think Prince Nduka Obaigbena hit the nail on the head by, you know, 
asking to introduce the security task in, uh, tax in order to effectively you know, um, tackle insecurity in Nigeria. I mean, so much to unpack here. We also talked about the increase in police salary, the 20 percent. Well, I don't believe that it, it's in the budget yet, but mm. we'll see how that goes for the mm. police officers. And also the issue of, you know, res the response that Lai Mohammed gave uh, in terms of um, responding to former mm. president Olu Shegun Abbasanjo. So, uh, great, great one by President Dukar Bayagbana. You know, when he said, I talked about security tax, and uh, real quickly, I would just like to pay tribute to Simon Dazaya, yes. you know, a man that stood for so much. Yes. I mean, he so constantly rest in peace. You know, something very formative about Simon Dazaya was how he, although he was trained as a pharmacist, but the fact that he knows that enunciating alternative voices, constructive criticism in society will move society forward. And he did that with his leadership newspaper, you know, good columnists will always write about Nigeria, very passionate about the country. Uh, he would always say for God and country. You know, that was something very noteworthy about Simon Zai. I mean, he continued to rest. And uh, about the security tax, it's not new. We've had it before. During the Civil War, you know, we had people collected extra taxes to, be able to support the war efforts and the likes. And that helped a great deal. And, you know, some other states have done this model. You know, Legal Security Trust Fund is one of them. That's not really a tax, but like a donation to the trust fund, you know, that has helped a great deal as regards security in Lagos. So having a system, you know, that is run with the trusteeship, you know, is a, a way to go, you know, as regards ensuring that we have more fun. I, I think the end goal is how can we put more money into security? But my argument, it's not just about using money to get hardware. That's not going to bring about security. We need to tackle the root cause of insecurity. I met a girl from Borneo. She's gone in to win the Guinness Book of World Record prize for the longest read aloud marathon session. They're currently on at the Yaba, you know, library there. And they've been reading for over 15 days nonstop. And this girl is an orphan. And there's a school where she teaches other orphans in Borneo. And she was orphaned and she's teaching other orphans for free. They're putting money together to pay for their WIAC fees and things like that. And she was telling me about the insecurity problem in Borno and what she went through. And she said something very profound. She said, Mr. Rafai, bullets will kill terrorists, but education will kill terrorism. Okay. When you check the Nigerian budget, about 1.2 trillion into education, budgeted in the 16 trillion budget we're having, but 2.1 trillion budgeted for security. When are we gonna get a day where the major investment is going to be in education. Because I think once we start to wrap up that investment in education, education comes to the north, then we create jobs for a lot of people. We put in a great welfare system in place. And I'm not just saying in the north, I'm saying across board. Yes. We reduce poverty. Once you start to do that, then, to a large extent, you start to fight the problem of insecurity. And I'll tell but you why. But you know, Rufai, I, I disagree with you because there is insecurity in other nations that have good education. Great. So I'll tell you why. I'll tell you this is. This can be traced to insecurity. And in other nations that have insecurity, it is simply because of this investment that lacks over the years. And I'll give you an instance. Yes. There's a rebel group in Peru called the Shining Path Rebel. For so many years, they attacked the Peruvian government until a certain scientist called Hernando de Soto, an economist, said, I know how to fight this insecurity. They thought he was mad. He said, let's give these people property rights. Because property rights was a big challenge in Peru. The people of those areas supported those terrorist group because of the insecurity and because of the fact that there was no property right and they couldn't trade. Once they give property rights, the problem started to ameliorate. So those are the challenges we should look at. And I think it also segues into the conversation on, on uh, Lai Mohammed. Yeah, and that was where I was going as well, Mr. Daifeni, in terms of his response to, um, I believe you would, you would call it an accusation by former President Olusha Gumobasanjo that President Muhammadu Buhari is not doing enough to tackle insecurity. What do you make of his response? Well, there? if uh, what the former president was quoted as saying that we shouldn't expect more than what President Buhari has offered thus right. far, um, with some, somebody who is in the twilight of his presidency. I don't think there should be much argument about mm. that. But the response of Lai Mohammed, Mohammed the information minister, his job must be a tough one. 
uh, because <laughs> some of the things he said, I'm sure many Nigerians will not agree with him. Yes. Yes, it is easy to forget where we are coming from. Trying to tell us the swaths of land Boko Haram had captured, had captured by 2014 and they were occupying and they were even paying tax. Is he not aware that farmers in Borno pay taxes now? Pay <laughs> levies. Yes. Maybe let's use levies now. Mm -hmm. To these insurgents in order to assess their farms and if they don't pay, they are killed. Mm -hmm. So what has changed? I don't know. He's the information minister. <laughs> now, sure the governor of Niger State came out to say that these insurgents are occupying two local governments in his state. A shouting distance for the, from the federal capital territory. Yes. The chief executive officer of Niger State, Governor Bello. Are these Boko Haram? Are they not still close to Abuja? Yes. Now, Nigerians, those who use Kaduna Abuja Expressway, will see that what the minister is saying is absolutely incorrect. By 2015, when President Buhari came to power, the train which uh, service or the rail which Jonathan was constructing had not taken off. And people were traveling that road without having their hearts in their mouth. Mm. Today, we know better. Yes. People are killed, hacked down. Whether you are a military man or not, you, have, you would rather use the train. Is that not insecurity? Mm. Insecurity is widespread. People from the president's home state, Casina, will just assume that this minister is talking because they were not having this level of insecurity even before their son became president. It, it, it even got worse. I mean, we've only just released some videos. Zamfara indigents mm -hmm. will Lamented. not agree that we are better off now. Mm -hmm. The people of Sokoto, the Sultan has spoken yes. mm -hmm. on this matter. The governor of Sokoto State, I mean, they have spoken on this matter. They are less insecure now than in 2015 when the president came yes. to power. So what is... Mm -hmm. Elijah Lai Mohammed talking about. You don't have to respond to everything. That is what I think I should just tell him. Because this narrative he has just given is, <laughs> well, you think it's there for the records, but the people know better. Mm -hmm. The people know better, Nigerians know better that we are more insecure now than in 2015. Mm -hmm. When we voted for President Muhammad Buhari, I did not vote. So let me not remove myself because I was doing my job as a journalist. Yes. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And right now, those who voted because is yes, a general who can yes. deal with this insecurity. Many of them are disappointed. Yes. Most Nigerians are disappointed. So Elijah Lyman cannot just change the narrative by reading a press statement and um, all these fine lines. Mm -hmm. No, you know, but it's always very Nigeria is more insecure so. now than in 2015. Yeah. It is yes. a fact. Yes, and, and that, that explains perhaps why our security. Our vote for security will keep going up. Going up, yeah. Yes. And it's going up. Two trillion. So but I, I was I, just going to say, it's always very effective to actually point out the things President Muhammadu Buhari has done instead of responding in that manner in which he has done. No, no, no. He, a he, lot of he, he, inaccurate So, So the truth is, Oji, he pointed out, he pointed he out the out. things yeah. uh, he feels the president has done. We're not getting more equipment. But the truth is, we are not getting more equipment. Which than the, Jonathan couldn't do yeah. because yeah. of Amada American like. uh, problems. But, but the most important thing is, it's about a narrative. He's pushed out his narrative. But you can hear Mr. Fini's counter narrative. Real quickly, congratulations to police officers on the increment, 20% increment. Yes, yes, yes. We yes. Have, but no, kudos, kudos to the president. Kudos to the president. But and to the NSAS <laughs> protesters. Exactly. We made protesters. that one of their major points. But, but amidst all of this, let's not forget that inflation rate is 15.4%. No, but there's something that has been given to the policemen. Yeah, but we're glad about it. We'll, we'll get to that maybe yeah. in the newspaper review. Very we'll well said, down. gentlemen. That's all on the news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus Odiri and Michael Wilson to give us updates on Africa global business activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News.
Our dependable Rotus Odiri is here to give us Africa business update. Well, over to you, Rotus. Good morning. Good morning, Oji. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, morning Mr. Ifeni. Good morning to all our viewers. Yeah, we kick off with uh, inflation figures that were released uh, late in the afternoon uh, from the Bureau of Statistics. We usually get them at 8.30 in the morning. But uh, I don't know. Lately, this, either they don't aren't released on time or you get them really late. So anyway, 15.4% is what we saw year on year um, for November. And it's inflation, this is the eighth month in a row that inflation has moderated um, in Nigeria. So uh, we're at 15.99% in October. Uh, and I believe in November of 2020, this is a 12-month low um, for inflation figures um, in, uh, in Nigeria. We're at 14.89% in uh, November of 2020. So again, on an annual basis, it's the base effect where we're coming from, you know, a high base from last year. You remember the border closures in October 20, August 2019 that, you know, so, you know, spiraled into the new year and into 2020 and pushed food inflation upwards. Um, so we're starting to see that down. However, however, you know, the data showed interesting things. On a month-on-month -month basis, headline inflation actually increased. Uh, I think it was 1.01% for November from 0.98% in uh, October. Um, and for food inflation, food inflation did uh, decelerate to 17.21%, uh, and that's also, uh, it's an improvement. I mean, it was at 18.34, uh, I believe, uh, in October. However, the same thing, on a month-on-month -month basis, you, ha you have food inflation at over 1%, and I think 0.91%. Uh, uh, for October. So what we're seeing is on a year-on-year -year basis, because of the base effect, you're seeing inflation moderates, but on a month-on-month -month basis, which I think is more accurate, um, you are seeing it rise. And if you ask the average uh, Nigerian on the streets how, you know, um, what the impact on their pockets, they will tell you that, I mean, it's still high. I mean, look, it's 17 percent. Uh, what? Uh, inflation came out in the UK. Actually, I don't know if I should even... Let me not use the UK. Let me use South Africa. South Africa's inflation was at a five-year high of 5.5%. So you got single digits in South Africa. You got, I believe, single digits in... in Ghana. The, is Ghana single? I think Ghana is not, double. Ghana is 10.8%. 10%. 10%. Yeah, but they, but they were, yeah, exactly. But, but they were single for a Exactly. They were single for a while. Senegal is single. You know, so... so um, um, Look, the, by and large, from here, numbers are still high. Nigerians are feel, still feeling the pressure, although the government will say it's been moderating and, and, and coming down. So, yeah, that, that's the story on uh, inflation figures. And by the way, since this is the festive season and we're going to have people you know, hosting parties, buying food, cooking food, I, ex I actually think that we might see an uptick um, still on a month-on-month -month basis when we get into January and look at inflation for December Perhaps because of the base effects for, you know, from 2020 to 2021, we could still see year-on-year -year inflation come down. But I expect for the Christmas season, food inflation and the likes will still be up. From inflation, we go to infrastructure. The Bankers Committee, the, the CBN Governor, Gordon Mephele, had a very robust speech at this Bankers Committee. Yesterday, we talked about the need for cheap finance for SMEs. Well, he also talked about infrastructure and how the Bankers Committee is looking to fund more infrastructure projects um, in 2022. For instance, the I, I think I heard Rufai talking about uh, one of the expressways or so. The Lagos Ibadan Expressway, they are committing about 170 billion naira to improving the uh, Lagos Ibadan ex Expressway. Bankers Committee of announcement from the CBN that that is what is going to be put forward. Gordon Emefele also <coughs> talked about the need for tolled roads. He said tolled roads are vital and that a lot of these projects need to pay back. I mean, if you're going to put money into a project, uh, Rufa, I think I've heard you mention this before. I'm not sure what your, your take is on tolled roads, but you need, to get, you, need to get the, you need to get the money back. You need to get your money back for the mm -hmm. investment that you've made. The, the, the infrastructure somehow has to pay for itself. So again, again, next year is a pre-election year. It's going to be interesting to see, uh, you know, how much is pumped into the economy in order to support various sectors. But the Bankers Committee, again, in total, Central Bank has put out like 3.5 trillion over in in, in um, supports to different sectors. Don't forget their um, ex their um, intervention funds, the interest rates at single digits. We're talking about you know rates and so on. All right, very quickly, real estate, uh, Lagos, the Lagos State Government. <laughs> is looking to make a move on monthly rental payments. Um, they are packaging this as a social investment scheme. They had a forum 
uh, at Echo Hotels and Suites, the advisor to the governor on housing. Um, I think her name is Toke Benson uh, Akinoa. Uh, so she said that they are looking at working with the formal economy first. So that is people in formal employment who have verifiable means of income that they're going to work with to get monthly payments on rent. They did a survey. According to the survey, 88% uh, of Lagosians, uh, so you know, want uh, monthly payments. I'm not sure who the other. 12 or so percent is that don't want mm -hmm. monthly rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that's our update. The, the, those are the bourgeoisies. Those yeah, I want to pay rent. Right. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I was going to okay. say before, yeah, yeah. sorry, I wanted to piggyback on what you've just said about this rent payment. I had Ms. Toke Benson Awoyinka. Awoyinka, thank you so much. Weekend, okay. uh, regarding this topic. Oh, great. I think it's a win-win situation for, um, you know, Lagosians at this point because basically what they're doing is they're going to, I think the Lagos state government has, you know, decided to invest about five mil billion uh, naira for this scheme, yep. and they are going to be paying landlords up front. Okay, you know, so it's basically a win-win for everyone. Basically, you have to provide your, you know, proof of income mm -hmm. to the government to show that you are able mm. to afford the yearly um, rent, and you know they'll go through the banks and financiers for this whole scheme. Yeah. Um, and I think also they're going to start with the formal sector and then they will go move towards the informal sector yeah. in terms of registering the, um, you know, uh, tenants for this yeah. scheme. But, 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 that's, that's a great one. That's yeah, a great what, one. What no, no, this, this is an extensive conversation. Yeah. There's not yeah. enough time. Should this be packaged as a social investment scheme when, I, I, look, Lagos State is basically coming in between the landlords and the tenants, yeah? And is the bridge financing uh, mechanism that is actually, they're taking the risk off the hands of the landlords. The landlords are still getting paid upfront on an annual basis. Yes. But in other so, climes, we've all, everyone has been overseas, we've all lived yeah. overseas, yeah. we all paid our rents but monthly. Yes, so monthly. It, it's, I don't know. It's, yeah, but it's because there's no credit scheme here. So thank you, thank you. So, 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 so okay. no credit system should we not be, be addressing the problem rather than the symptoms and address, so, look, Gordon Mefele talked about credit yesterday, right? Yeah. We need a credit scheme. That's you've, that. you've talked about anyway, So you're look, thinking and, that and should that. come before this yes, whole Yes. But that, it that, is a Herculean task for okay, a lot of people uh, to raise one okay. year right. Right. Can, I, can, I, can I make a point? Yeah. So I've got a lot to say this morning. I don't think if I have the time for it. Number yeah. one, I want to talk about tolls. Tolls are roads. Yeah, okay, okay, roads. okay. Tolls okay. are very good. Yeah. But the truth is, we all know the Nigerian factor has affected tolls over the years. Why did Obasanjo pull them out? Oh, in the end, the people you concession the tolls to, the money wasn't getting to the government. So what's the, what's the deal? So he scrapped all of them. That's what's happening. Yeah. If it can be transparent, it's a good way to raise money back for the investment. But I repeat, if it can be transparent. When you say transparent, some people are diverting the money that's supposed to be paid for tolls. It's going elsewhere instead of to the state coffers. Yes. All right. So that's always the case with tolls. And that's why, to a large extent, a lot of people, you know, kick against tolls, really. It's just a level of transparency that we don't see. Uh, I'll allow Mr. Fendi to make the point because I know we don't have time. Yes. Because I know time uh, is Let me just spent. quickly look at the inflation. Inflation, okay. Yes. 15.99% inflation rate any day, anywhere is high. Right. That's double digit inflation. And of course, uh, when you say, oh, the rate of inflation is, com is coming down, it's good music to the ears of those in gov right. government officials, right. but certainly not to ordinary folks out there who feel the brunt. Right. The good thing you put side by side, the month to month, uh, month on month in uh, inflation rate is going up. Yeah. And food inflation, 17.21 percent, very it's high. Still high. Right. So right. Right. when the average Nigerian say, says, well, I don't understand what they are saying about inflation <laughs> coming down, mm. truly they are correct. Yeah. Because inflation rates coming down, that, that rate is the rate at which prices go oh, up. Right, right. So yeah. we have to put that clearly there. Mm -hmm. So we still have a lot of work to do to bring down inflation. And until you do that, this is a burden to the economy. Then talking about Tolling the roads. I'm just particularly interested in that uh, Lagos Ibadan Expressway. I'm a stakeholder on that road. Yeah. I, don't to, I don't need to explain <laughs> beyond that. And then, um, if the Bankers Committee are putting 170 billion for that road, how much have been spent so far? We thought we were rounding off the, that road now, mm. but 170 billion will go a long way to just 
finishing that road. It's been dragging for too long. This administration has done six years plus on that road, yet we are still uh, not there yet. But is this a loan? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Right, right. Is it a loan? Bank, bankers Committee cannot give gratis to government. Mm. So we want to be clear on that. Right. Are you tolling? At what point are you going to start the tolling? Yes, tolling is good. If you put in money, you recover your money. Right. But when government does that tolling, that's where you have this lack of transparency. Because they give it to uh, political uh, associates mm. and boys. Mm. Job for the boys. Job and when you give boys. job to the boys, <laughs> what do they do? They help themselves. Right. And that's what I've been doing. Unfortunately, Obasan just stopped the tolling, but also destroyed the toll gates. So now if you want to toll, you have to build, build new ones. Again. Yeah. You can stop tolling, but why did you destroy the toll gates? Good question. Mm. All over the country. So we will not spend more money to do another set of toll gates. That's where Obasanjo got it wrong when he mm. stopped the tolling. Mm. Strong point. Strong All point. Right. Strong point. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rose. Really Thank appreciate you. it. So uh, moving on to more business. So we've got Michael Wilson. He joins us now from London. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Asia Pacific's markets uh, mix. No prizes for guessing what everybody's thinking about. It was that aggressive stance from the Fed uh, last night, yesterday afternoon that, that actually did it all. Uh, a bit of a relief rally, rather strangely, actually. The Nikkei is up about 1.74%. Uh, um, and uh, Hong Kong's Hang Seng slipped very, very slightly. Uh, China mainland shares advanced. Uh, in Australia, the market struggled for gain. At least their central bank is now saying uh, that um, they will not that increase is, rates okay. until what they described as inflation is sustainably uh, in the 2 to 3% uh, target range. And staying in the region of uh, Australia, let me tell you about Qantas. And Qantas Airlines um, is switching its domestic fleet to Airbus. It's, it's a big blow for Boeing, this actually, because um, it, today um, the, the agreement is subject to board approval, which is expected by 2022. Um, after the pilots were involved as well. Deliveries, apparently, uh, of the Airbus would start in 2023 to replace and what they'd, what's described as an ageing fleet of 75 Boeing 737s and 2717s. Um, as far as uh, big investors are concerned, a note from asset managers or two asset managers this morning, it's game over for US-listed China companies. Um, Chinese companies listed on Wall Street will likely to be uh, cut off um, after three years of sort of tensions between Beijing and Washington. That's still going on. They think that by 2024, uh, most of the Chinese companies listed on the U.S. exchanges are no longer going to be exist, uh, listed in the United States. And as we know, many of China's top listed companies listed in the U.S. have already uh, undertaken dual listings in Hong Kong, for example, Alibaba, JD.com, Baidu, gaming firm NetEase, and most recently, the uh, social media giant Weibo. Right, let's go to semiconductors. Intel is going to invest $7 billion uh, in a new plant in Malaysia. That's going to create 9,000 jobs. It's a new chip packaging and testing factory. Um, it's it's actually, uh, obviously, a, a big blow that's happened to uh, semiconductors as well. The new facility in Manila, uh, in Malaysia, is expected to begin, begin production in 2024. Uh, and as we know, a global uh, shortage uh, of semiconductors has hit really everybody. Malaysia chip assembly industry according of course for more than a tenth of the global market so it's quite big news for them so let's get to the UA the United States not big news from the Fed at last the Fed will aggressively dial back its bond buying uh, into uh, seeing three rate hikes next year as well the Federal Reserve has provided multiple indications uh, that it's going to uh, it's going to stop its ultra ease policy. It's going to be buying $60 billion worth of bonds each month, half the level of what was happening in November, and uh, and uh, $30 billion less than it had been buying in December. So the taper is afoot. After that wraps up in uh, late winter or early spring, the central bank expects to start uh, raising rates. So a, big, a, a bit of a relief rally, um, at least investors sort of know where the where the fed's actually coming from s p up about one and a half percent uh the dow up about 385 and all three were in negative territory before the fed made its uh, aggressive announcement yesterday let me take you to the eu this is an important one from germany the new uh 
the new the new leader Olaf Scholz has warned of um, a threat of threats by extreme anti-vaxxers. It turns out that uh, police carried out a raid in Saxony after the state president there became victim of an alleged an alleged murder plot. It didn't actually happen. That's why the police uh, moved in. But what he's saying is, look, you know, we've got the lowest one of the lowest vaccination rates in Western Europe. Unbelievable, isn't it? But that's where Germany is right now, and so is. Um, fighting against anti-vaxxers and the kind of um, uh, opinions that they're spreading, saying don't do that, get vaccinated. So finally, a big you, a big decision for the Bank of England today. Inflation hit a ten-year high yesterday. Uh, which way is it going to go? Higher transport and energy costs um, have increased this rise. Um, its chief economist is uh, talking about fuel, energy, clothing, and second-hand cars being big factors in that in yesterday's figures, uh, and the cost of raw materials materials has actually risen hugely. So what will they do? The expectation, we heard what the IMF said yesterday, uh, they were predicting inflation could be around five and a half percent by next year and, and has been warning the bank not to sub succumb to what they call inaction bias. Well, we'll see about that. And soon after the Bank of England announces, we get news from the European Central Bank where uh, inflation is also rather high, although core inflation uh, much lower. What will the ECB do? Uh, the ECB do then? I'll be talking with Rotus about that later today. And as far as commodities are concerned, a small jump in oil prices, um, feeling that never, never mind what the Fed said about aggressiveness and so on. It's feeling they're not quite sure about the Omicron variant at the moment, but it does seem to be not causing the sort of long-term harm, even though it's highly infectious. And that's caused Brent crude oil futures up 65 cents to 74.53, WTI up to 71.61. And despite that aggressive, uh, there's aggressive words from the Fed, which you would imagine would boost the dollar and therefore make gold more expensive and less attractive. um, Well, it's benefiting very, very slightly from this saying that uh, the, the, the words are that, um, that the, the, Federal, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell said that economic data was key and that the path to rate hikes were not definite. So that's really where we are right now. That's the global view. Right. Marco, real quickly, two things. Uh, yesterday, you were very bullish <clears throat> as regards not listening to the IMF. Oh, uh, not the time to raise the interest rate. The IMF can say all they want. You know, all the things you said about the IMF yesterday. But hasn't the IMF been proven right, Michael? Uh, number one. Number two, what is happening in America? Three rate rises we're expecting next year. What's going to be the outlook like from the Fed? Okay, IMF. No, what I was saying yesterday, let me be absolutely clear about this. What I'm saying is, I don't care. I don't think anybody cares what the IMF says. It's down to central banks to make decisions. They are not influenced by the IMF. The IMF may be right, may be wrong, don't know. But really, it's down to central banks, as the Fed showed. And let's hope that the the, the British Central Bank, the Bank of England, actually makes a decision on the evidence. In other words, if it's unsure about whether inflation is spiking or underlying, and it's unsure about the the employment situation, Situation in the country, uh, and, and it's also unsure of where the new variant's going, then they will stay their hand. That is a decision for them. It's not for the IMF. That's what I was saying yesterday. As far as the United States is concerned, what we're looking at is three marginal rate rises next year. That is, that's according to what the markets are saying. Let me stress that. The gold, gold buyers have been saying, as I said, that because it's not definite, then gold gold has risen very, very slightly. Now, these are all big indicators and what the market thinks. So what 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 we what what happened in the United States is that they, they were aggressive about inflation. They are tapering their bond asset buying. There may be three interest rate rises next year. That was the that was the sort of hint from the Fed yesterday, but that's what central banks do. We wait to see. I would I would hedge my bets on the fact that I'm not exactly sure of the effects of the new virus on economies all the way around the world, even though it may not be as harmful. And even though drugs companies are coming out every day saying, you don't, you know, it's it's enough to have the one booster. It's enough to have the two vaccinations and a booster. You know, it's it's all very indefinite at the moment. Far too, far too soon to be to be actually betting on what's going to happen. All I can tell you is that the market seemed to think from what the Fed said last night in its normal nudge and weak fashion, three rate rises next year. Okay, Michael. 10% 10% no 10 year high inflation rate with 
cost of raw materials taking a hit there in inflation, what is that going to do to British goods, export of British goods? At the time, British goods competing with European goods, exports there in the international market. Everybody's suffering from increased costs. It's not just, it depends where the, where the goods are sourced. That's a very, very complicated view. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good idea to be, to be putting one's mind across it, but it's, it's almost impossible because it depends where the materials are being sourced from to make the final manufactured goods that make up exports because somebody's going to have to take a hit on the price. But it won't just be UK exports. It'll be EU exports. It'll be China exports. And it'll also be US exports as well. So everybody is going to have to somehow work out which way they're going to go with rising raw material costs. So it's not just a matter for the UK, it's a global matter. And I think those various global economies grow in certain kind of ways. I mean, that's why we're interested in the Fed, which is looking after the largest economy in the world, taking their view on inflation and interest rates. Then we'll see the Bank of England, then we'll see the ECB. So these big decisions, these big decisions are being made about the biggest economies in the world and we want to know what central bankers actually think about that that's 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 going to give us an idea of maybe a, a, a little feeler towards answering your question but it's very very complicated indeed all right uh let's talk about property real estate let's talk about kazai uh the chicken has come up to roost the loans are mounting up the bond but well, the bond holders are trying to buy back that's to show that something is happening in the real estate sector in China that the world is not looking at. Two big property bohemots have gone down in the space of two months or three months. Evergrande now, Kasai the other one. Michael, what is happening out of China? I think it's too soon, really, to, to, to write both Kaizos, what, what you're talking about, and Evergrande actually off right now. What's happening is a managed dismantling of something which was part of the Chinese dream of having this um, unfettered capitalism and now clearly isn't. So what, that's why both these companies are taking an advice from central government about what, what I, again, you know, we, we've talked about this before. My view is what we're seeing is a managed dismantling of, of these of these property companies. And you yourself said that, you know, the, 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 the vacancies, as, as far as Evergrande's concerned, are, are insane. The, the amount of em empty properties which have not been taken up. So that didn't work. Now, I, as, as I, I may be proved wrong in this, but what I think is I cannot see the Chinese authorities allowing an overflow of these problems to the rest of the world because they would lose a massive amount of face. And obviously, President Jinping want, President Xi wants to have and society, which is, in his words, equal for all. And, and it does not include these property companies. So I think what we'll see is a managed dismantling of them. Yeah, it says a great deal about the property market. It says a great deal about speculation. And it says a great deal about the, the overweening desire of people to make money out of nothing. It, it, it's, it's not a business model. That, that's, that's the fact of it. And I think we're going to see those chickens, as you call them, coming home to roost next year. But how they do that, I think probably will be quite quietly and quite efficiently managed by the Chinese authorities they, because this is what communist states do. All right, Michael, real quickly, I also want to talk to you about the reaction to the stress test. Some industry watchers are saying, Ofgem doesn't know what they're doing. Is this a time to put in a stress test? That's been the reaction since yesterday that an announcement was made. Yeah, as I was saying yesterday, I, I really feel as though what I, I don't what I don't understand about the stress test is what, what's the stress? What, what extra stress are you going to put on a business model that, that clearly doesn't work? That's the answer, isn't it? Because what we've seen is that the capping of, of energy prices has acted to the detriment of smaller energy companies. Now, Ofgem itself, because it's in control of the market, says that nobody will be, will be without heat and light and all electric, electricity and all the rest of it. So they'll be sticking those customers into larger um to, in, in, into what's left of the industry now what industry is also saying uh, is, is also saying well you know it's fine to take these on but what are we going to do we some of us cannot cope with all these millions of extra customers i don't know what the figures i think it's probably about two million probably of displaced customers going towards other companies i, I I struggle, as I said yesterday, to see what stress test you could possibly put on anything which has which blatantly failed in the first place. 
All right, Michael, you talked about German counselor Olaf Scholz, who, you know, used basically 10 minutes of his inaugural speech to condemn anti-vaxxers. And, you know, at this point, I think in Germany, only about 70% of Germans have been double jabbed. Yesterday, we talked about legal implications. I would, I'd like your thoughts on, on his condemnation on anti-vaxxers. Well, as, as we were saying yesterday, it takes a big legal move to make vaccination mandatory. That's that's against m what most democracies actually believe in. You don't think you don't make things mandatory. Um, although it has to be said, it, as I've said to you before, if I've had to travel to Africa, it's mandated that I have a little yellow book, which we're showing injections that I've taken to protect me against yellow fever. Now, I don't think I'm going to get that in Lagos or in Abuja, but I might get it elsewhere. I don't mind that too much. I, I, I personally, I I feel that everybody should take the responsible action and trust the medical the medical science. I mean, that's 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 just the way I am. When I was little in this country, we had polio vaccinations. My parents didn't question them. I was just rolled up in the queue, two vaccinations. Thank you very much indeed, and get on with life. And we used to go to things called measles parties and mumps parties and German measles parties so that we could catch these diseases when they were young and develop um, what was what was thought to be a, a sort of um, a, 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 uh, an armor right. against... All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank, thank you so much, Michael, for your time. Really appreciate you. All right. Uh, we'll go straight to this. A statement by Chief Ayuadi Banjo, leader of Afeni Ferry, in response to the allegation made by Chief Bisi Akonde in his book, My Participation, to the effect that Chief Bola Tinubu built my house in Lekki for me on Thursday, December 16, 2021. About a week ago, last Thursday, 7 December to be exact, at the presentation of the book My Participation, Chief Bisi Akonde, it was said that Chief Bisi Akonde stated in his book that I brought pressure on Bola Tinubu to build the house for me. But since Bola Tinubu himself was present at the presentation, I expect him within a few days to refute such malicious falsehood about me emanating from his man. On Friday, I hold this view because Bola Tinubu just some three years ago, on the occasion of the presentation of my autobiography saying it as it is, that my incorruptibility and strength of character, he, Tinubu, will not have been governor of Lagos State in 1999. What then could he be demanding from me after his two-term governorship to make me pressurize him to build a house for me when I did not get a naira from him before he became the governor? There have been a lot of pressure on me not to react to Chief Bissiak or these tantrums. He's a neophyte and a beneficiary of the struggle he never took part in. I have been urged to keep to the adage that says, answer a fool lest you reduce yourself to his level. But there's also an adage that says, answer a fool lest he thinks he is wise. A lot has been said in the press and the social media to demolish tantrums. But I owe a duty to myself to put the record straight for posterity about the big lie that Bola Tinubu built my house for me in Lekki. I therefore say categorically that my house at Lekki was built with my resource through the sale of three developed properties and loan from GT Bank and the sale of underdeveloped landed property given to me by my late leader, Chief Obafemi Awolowo of blessed memory. The details are as follows. A four-bedroom duplex with two-bedroom flat enclosed with two undeveloped plots at plot four, Block 14, Nuru Oni Oniwo Street, Aguda, Surule, Lagos. This is where I was living before moving to Lekki. The house was commissioned in 1972 by Chief Obafemi Awolowo. A wing of the duplex was once occupied by a staff of the security outfit, then known as Special Branch, headed by the late Alaji M.D. Yusuf, who later became Inspector General of Police, when General Olushegun Obasujo was head of state. It was later occupied by one of the wives of Chief Pius, Akinye Dure, who often visited his wife there in company of Senator Bola Tinubu. The gate of the property was forced open by Abacha security forces when Nadeko was holding a send-off party for American Ambassador Walter Carrington in my house. I took the federal government to court for damages and I was awarded one million naira, which has not been paid to today by the federal government. Mr. Lisa Bakoba SAN was my counsel. The house was sold to St. Bart's Anglican Church, Aguda Surulere. The two-story building at Odedola Street, Suruleri, Lagos State. 
I bought it through an estate agent by one Mr. Shiwonyuku, who has relocated to UK, and he has a brother who is a legal practitioner in Abuja. The house was sold to a Ghanaian by the name Mr. Akapo, who, still, who is still alive, and he lives in one of the flats in the building. The four-story building with a warehouse on the ground floor and six flats on top. It was commissioned by Chief Oba Femi Awolowo in 1977. I inherited the 45 by 100 from my mother, Salmot Animo Adebanjo, who built a bungalow on it. She bought the land when I was in primary school in 1940 from Paido Wonitiri for 20 pounds, which she paid by instrumental payment of 10 pounds, 7 pounds and 3 pounds. He sold, his son, Akobi Onitiri, executed the conveyance for me without extra payment after showing him that the purchase of receipt from his father, which I was developing it in 1976. Akombi Onitiri is the father of Sumbo Onitiri, a well-known estate surveyor in Lagos. The building was sold to a woman through an estate agent. I then took a loan from GT Bank to complete the house in Lekki, where I'm living now. When the interest on the loan became unbearable, I was compelled to sell the underdeveloped land given to me by Chief Awulowo in Dideolu Estate in Morocco and Victoria Island. One Mr. Ade Utusonya, a friend of my son, Chief Femi Ayo Banjo, bought the land. The contractor who built my lucky house is engineer Hakim Suleiman, senior partners of Messrs. H.A. Associates. The electrical and mechanical contractor is Chief Tokumbo Oshokoya, senior partner of Messrs. O'Shea Projects. The architect is Mr. Deji Johnson. The quantitative surveyor is late Otumba TB Adebayo. The lucky property, the house in my village, is Sonya Ogbo and three bedroom flats in the townhouse at Omorire Street in Lekki are properties that I have in the whole world. I hereby authorize the EFCC to verify the facts above. It is alleged that Chief Bisi Akonde's building at Ilaorogun, which I understand is more than the double, is more than double the expanse of my house in Lekki, and some other property he has in Lagos and abroad were financed by Bola Tinubu. His house in Ibadan was also alleged to have been built by the contractor the contractor that built the secretariat in Oshogbo when he was governor of Osho State. I hereby challenge Chief Bisi Akonde to clear the air by disclosing the source of financing these properties, as I have done above. Ashiwajubola Mentinubu, the great philanthropist, should also disclose the source of his wealth, which he bankrolled the elections of the APC and the Southwest and that of General Muhammad Buhari and his various properties in Lagos. He should also authorize the EFCC to verify such details as I have done above. Thank you very much. God bless Nigeria. This is signed by Chief Ayo Adebanjo on the 16th of December 2021. By a lot of allegations here to unpack. Yes. And he did say this, you know, when we spoke to him in the yes. interview, the last interview we had, he said he was going to reply on Thursday. And true to time, he has replied, and he has stated the source at which he got the property. But he has not only stopped there. He has also challenged, you know, those that said that he got the property from Bola Metinubu to also disclose where they got their own property. I mean, this is getting interesting in the political season. And this on the heels of the book, My Participation, which I took out time to read extensively yesterday, you know. That was what dominated. Oh, you did? Yeah, I read the book, uh, got it around 6 p.m., finished it around 11.30 p.m. in about four hours. So I, I did see, you know, most of But in the book, this, the property issue was not talked about. But it was an extensive book. You know, apart from the politicking, talked about, you know, the beginning for Chief Bissia Kondi High was part of the Constituent Assembly in the 70s you know, snowballing into serving in the government of Chief Bolaiki as uh, secretary to the, to, to the state government and also, you know, becoming deputy governor and the likes, the political tantrum that ensued between Bolaiki and uh, Chief SM Afolabi and the likes and what happened in the Western region, leading on to the military era, leading on to the Nadeko days, leading on to the convening, you know, of uh, what is known to be a Feni Ferry today, the G38 and some other groups started by the Bolaegi that snowballed into the Alliance for Democracy, you know, uh, the dissolution of the Alliance for Democracy, you know, when the Alliance for Democracy became factionalized, his emergence, you know, as uh, governor, 
his uh, relationship with uh, Chief uh, Mujia Kifenwa, his days also in prison in the 80s, you know, when he was being jailed by President Muhammad uh, Buhari's administration when they came in then and all of that. And then, you know, the emergence of this coalition, you know, the first deal they tried to make, you know, under a a AC, then Action Congress was called with Tatiku Abubaka and how that went and how the fact that putting Yemi Oshibaju's name forward for vice presidential candidate, it was the second time they were going to do it. In okay. fact, they did tell President Muhammad Buhari at first in 2011 that he should change uh, Pastor Tunde Bakari's name with Yemi Oshibajo's name. You know, that was their own part of the deal to support Buhari. But late minute, Pastor Bakari, and the agreement then was that Pastor Bakari should write a letter you know, that he was going to resign. But Pastor Bakari replied and all of that. So there are many things about the book, but all of this snowballed from yes. the book. Uh, well, Stephanie, we'll Stephanie, come back to you. In terms of the allegations, should um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu respond at this point? Well, Chief Ayo Adebanjo promised to give his response yes. to that allegation by Thursday today, and he has done just that. Now, for the neutrals, mm. we heard an allegation made by Chief Bisa Konde. Now, the allegation has been countered by Chief Adib Ayo Adibanjo, and he has also made his own allegations. Mm. There's one man that is at the center of both allegations now. For Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Dinubu, Silence cannot be golden on this matter. Yes. No, that's, a, that's what I think. Silence cannot be golden. We also need to hear from him. Because for Chief Bishita Akonde to say, he pestered, uh, Ayo Adibanjo, pa, Adibanjo pestered uh, Bola Metinibu to build his lucky house. Um, ordinarily, thank God the old man is still alive at 90. Because if he had said this, this when the man was dead, mm. <laughs> it would be difficult for any other person to come out and defend the memory of this man, mm -hmm. uh, Chief Ayo Adebanjo, but he's alive. Thank God he's still very, very sharp mentally, and he has chronicled events how he built his house, how he raised every cover to build the house, the property he sold, the ones he inherited, how he got the land, donation from uh, uh, gift from Chief Awolowo. Of course, we know that Chief Awolowo had Vast, vast expanse, expanse of, of land, land yeah. did you estate. Especially did you yes. estate, yes. You know, and it's not surprising that one of his closest uh, allies was given a gift in one of those uh, estates. So for now, we expect to hear from Bola Ahmed Tinubu. You see, I just take your back, mind back. When we were undergraduates, I'm sure Ruben will remember this mm. story. A policeman contested and became the student union president. But well, you know what happened? Even before he indicated, because nobody knew he was a policeman, somebody countered that this is a policeman trying to be plant. They want to plant him. The federal government want to plant him mm. in the student union. And you know what that guy did? Immediately his campaign kicked off because he brought out an article. He wrote, why serving the police, countering, uh, that is, supporting students that were attacked mm. by policemen. Mm. He did that while he was a pol still in the service mm. and was not a student. So he started his campaign from there. So this is an opportunity for Bola Ahmed Tinubu to kick off his campaign because <laughs> he has to clear the air on all this matter. Did he give a gift? Did he sponsor the building of Chief Ayala Dembaja's residence? Did he build a house for Chief Bisi Akonde as alleged? And, of course, additional... Uh, questions which Chief Adimba, Adibanjo has posed. Mm. Bola Ahmed Tinubu should also tell the world yes. how he made his money, his stupendous wealth. I'm sure I will not be exaggerating when I use the word stupendous. stupendous wealth, yes. yeah. So he needs to explain. So the ball has been pushed out. And mm. to me, it's like it's rolling into the court of Ashiwaju mm. Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who has said he will take up the mm. court for him to run. For the president. And another yes. part of this is, in making this challenge, Chief Ayade Banjo has also invited the EFCC to look at this, you know, to help them compare notes as it is, because this is...
comparing of notes, he's been able to state, and he detailed up to the extent people and names. And he said some are still alive, some are late. And I think in all of this, maybe in comparing the notes, they will look at the engineers, mechanical engineers that built his own building, the architect and the like and all of that. Those people can be called upon. But like you said rightly, Ashura Jubala Ahmed Tinubu has a role to play in all of this. He has to come out straight. And there, there's definitely going to be a rebuttal by Ashiwaju Bisi Akondetu, because uh, Bisi Akondetu is an Ashiwaju. Okay. Is an okay. Ashiwaju of Ilaorogo. Okay, okay. He was given that title in 1982. Okay, so, I was uh, wondering. <laughs> Ashiwaju Bisi Akondetu okay. has to come out, you know, and counter this. So it's, it's, it's political season started in full swing. And we are here. Yeah. For the records, to keep all this for the records. We're waiting yeah. for, uh, for, my, for more, more expose on this matter. So, is it yeah. safe to say Arise TV is your TV of records? <laughs> <laughs> Leave that for this day for now. <laughs>